Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden, Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If you are one of our regular listeners, welcome. It is so good to be back here with you. And thank you so much for tuning in. And if you're new to the podcast, allow me to say hello and welcome you as well and introduce myself. I have the most wonderful job ever. I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and encourager of souls. And yes, I made up my own job title, (laughs) one of the perks of working for yourself. So I have a wonderful variety of offerings, including angel sessions, which are as magical as they sound. They take place over the phone and I help you connect with your angels and your divine guidance and so much more. And then I offer a longer form of support, soul mentoring. And then a lovely variety of classes that will inspire your spirit. My classes are typically small in size, less than eight people. So you won't get lost in the crowd. You will get to join a sweet, intimate group of other heart-centered people. And the class that I am starting this coming week, which may have already happened by the time you hear this message, is called Co-Creating Miracles in Business and Life. And the energy flowing through it is just beautiful. And I just share that with you as an example of the kinds of classes I facilitate. I am somebody who loves magic. I don't mean like, you know, let me pull a rabbit out of your hat kind of thing. I mean, I think we're all magical beings. And I think amazing and lovely things happen when we focus our awareness into the places where inspiration and kindness and goodness exists. And one word for that can be miracles, how can be in this evolving stream of life and when we're fortunate life delights us so here's to delight finding you and as the title infers this is a sleep podcast and you are welcome to listen whether you're in the middle of your day and wide awake and plan on staying awake for a while longer or whether you're falling asleep. For those of you that have been listening for a while, thank you so much for being here. And and I do have a request. Would you be so kind as to leave a rating and a review on your favorite podcast app for this broadcast? And it will help other people find their way here too. So this podcast is inspired by my great love for the sleep podcast genre. I do listen to a sleep podcast every night as I'm drifting off to sleep. I used to be someone that would use the television as a sleep tool, but I don't know, that stopped working for me as well. And and now I love putting in my earbuds at the end of the day when I'm curled up in bed and listening to something that will help me fall asleep. I had been listening to The Sleepy Bookshelf, Elizabeth Grace is in the midst of reading the book Valette by Charlotte Bronte, I believe. I had such a hard time understanding what this book was about. I was only about two episodes in. I think the the downside of sleep podcasts, but also the upside, is that I always fall asleep and I have no idea what is going on, so I listen to these books or whatever the episodes are in 10 minute increments and I can get rather lost. And so I was curious about what Follette is about and I went onto the Wikipedia 
and read the synopsis of this book and oh my god, a lot happens. And it didn't sound like a fun journey to me, so so I don't know that I will be listening to that book. <laughs> I'll have to find something else to keep myself in that sleepy vibe as I'm going off to dreamland. Good news is, this podcast also works for me. Last night I listened to the recipes from the Saga Nash cookbook to go to sleep and went right out. It was wonderful. So however you want to use this podcast, whether you're driving to work and you're wide awake, and please be wide awake when you're driving a vehicle, please, or you're going for your walk, or you're cooking dinner, or you're drifting off to sleep, it is truly a blessing to be here with you. And it is my intention to bring you waves of divine love, helping you remember who you are as a divine being in human form, to let you know you're a miracle, to inspire you and let you know that the world is better because you're here. So as I record this, this episode will be published on Sunday. Right now it's Friday and it's late morning. I usually record these early morning, but I had a bunch of things I was getting done and then the morning got away from me. And so here we are, the sun is out, the sky is blue. There is a hummingbird flitting about my neighbor's tree right now. So how about if I share some beautiful hummingbird energy with you? And we call in that beautiful essence of divine magic. You know, I've always been a girl who believed in magic, even if I didn't know what that meant. It has always been easy for me to daydream beyond physical world reality. My mom, my mom told me that when I was young, maybe three years old, I had a pet tiger. <laughs> she said, I talked about the pet tiger. I made my mom make room for the tiger to be with me at the table. So apparently I adopted my invisible friends very early on. Or perhaps it's better to say they adopted me. And so if you are also someone who has been in that realm of non-physical friends, imagined or etheric, because I don't know that we know the difference when we are young, welcome. It is lovely getting to expand our consciousness beyond our reality. That's what I love about the angels. We, we, we embody this vast consciousness and somehow we're taught that we're only supposed to use it in certain ways. And I believe this vast consciousness that each of us embodies is amazing. And I love to use my consciousness to help connect with the angels and perhaps inspire you to connect with them as well. So I experience the angels as divine messengers of light. They are ever present. They are here for all of us and not just human beings. I believe every molecule of beingness in this universe is loved. From a human perspective, we relate to this as angels or God, but it can take so many forms. Think of all the ways love finds us. You know, our, our cats, our dogs, a rainbow in the sky, a song that makes your heart happy. There's so many different ways we can be uplifted and reminded of the goodness of this world. And so 
I invite you to join me as we call the angels in now. And you just need to sit back. The angels will do the heavy lifting. There's nothing you need to do. Just breathe, which you're already doing anyways. So it's not like, you know, you have to do it for extra credit. You're already breathing. So take a nice deep breath in. And just let go of whatever it is that is here to be let go. Anything that came beyond this moment. Anything you're worried about. Just give it over to the angels. Turn your worries into prayers. And allow the generosity of your angels to meet you where you are. When you ask for their help, you are not taking them away from something more important. There is an abundance of support and love in this world. And your prayer requests, your requests for help, no matter how mundane or profound, there is support here for you. One of the first ways I started working with the angels, and, and I don't even know that I, I construed it as angels at the time, but more a form of manifesting. And this was back in the 80s. And I was in a, a class at Pepperdine. I was going for my MBA, which I never wound up getting. And it was a class in human development that the teacher taught through the perspective of metaphysics, which was crazy back then. And one of the stories he said is that he had a student and any time they needed a parking space, they would just say, think space. You know, this is all about, you know, law of attraction and your thoughts create your reality. So he or she, I don't remember what their gender would have been because I never met them. They would say, think space. And then they would always get a parking space. And this was a highly practical mode of manifestation, right? <laughs> I lived in Los Angeles. Getting a parking space definitely could be construed as a miracle in certain times and places. So I started invoking think space. I still do that. I'm like, think space. And the space opens up. So whether you're asking for a parking space or a heartfelt prayer for a loved one, This loving support is here for you. It's all the same. It's, it's like you don't have to ration out how you're going to use the sun. Whether you use the sun to dry your clothes or whether you have solar panels on your house or you allow the sun to warm you, you don't have to ration your utilization of sunlight. It exists. And when it is available, it exists and you can't wear it out. And I think of divine support that way. So whether I'm saying think space at Costco or I have a very heartfelt prayer for someone who I love who is very ill, it all draws from the same well of love and compassion and goodness and abundance. So take a deep breath in and out and we'll think angel. Think angel. Angel. Hello, angel. <laughs> Hello, angels. Welcome. And we'll take another deep breath in and out and I'll call the angels here. They are already here, but I love sharing this ritual with you. So beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here. And I ask that you infuse this broadcast with waves of love and inspiration and lightness of spirit. 
I ask for prayers of ease. Whatever it is that we are perceiving as difficult right now, please help make it easier. Please help us find our way to pivot into ease and grace and receptivity of the goodness that is here for us. I am so profoundly grateful for our sweet family of listeners. I'm so grateful for each one of you. That you are a beautiful, unique being here in this world. You carry wisdom in your heart. You carry love. You carry quirkiness, (laughs) brightness. And you are a wonder. And I am so grateful to have this time with you. So take another breath in and out. And please let the angels know how they can help you. Is there something they can do to support you? You have prayers in your heart you want to share with them? If so, just bring this forward. Just allow yourself to receive. And breathe. And receive some more. You're doing better than you know. And the angels say thank you for opening your heart to receive them. They are so profoundly grateful for you. It is their blessing to bring molecules of goodness upon your path to support you as you navigate your life. And as I speak these words, I am feeling the joy of your angels for this opportunity to be here with you now. I hear these words as I connect with this energy and they say, be not afraid of your path. God is with you. Be not afraid of your path. God, the benevolent, loving, generous God is with you. There is no judgment here of you. There is no worry here for you. We know the truth of your spirit. We know the truth of your essence. There is only love here for you. And we are grateful that you are willing to receive. So dear ones, just take another breath in, allowing this love to cascade through and around your physical body and your emotional body, your consciousness, and your life. And this love will ripple to all you love the people you love, the pets, the circumstances, places in the world that are meaningful to you. Everything you love is included in this bubble of light. The angels say thank you. And you are included in their bubble of light. I always love it when I am reminded that that whether it's the angels or friends, are praying for and with me. When someone says, oh, I've been praying for you. Oh, my heart just opens and I'm so grateful and how lovely that is. That someone will bring me into their prayers. And so I bring you into my prayers. And I say, thank God for the gift of you. May this moment bring you grace and well-being and love lots and lots of love 
So my beautiful ones, if you are in bed and preparing for sleep, I invite you to cozy on up and snuggle on in and drift off whenever you are ready. If I'm listening to this podcast, that's what I'm doing. I don't listen during the day. I only listen when I'm in bed. So I'll say this to myself. Honey, go on ahead and cozy on up and snuggle on in. You've done enough for this day. And it is time for you to drift off into that beautiful, wonderful, sweet space of dreams and rest. And with that, we are going to move on over into our story time. So I thought for this story time, I wanted to continue where we left off in the last story time, where I was reading to you from the magazine Country Life in America that was published in 2016. And here's why I want to go back to it. I was in the middle of reading an article about a group of people in Geneva, Illinois, who wanted to create a park in an island, on an island, I guess would be the right preposition, on an island in Geneva where children could play. At the time, Geneva had a lot of polarity. There was the very wealthy people and then also a lot of poor people. And the wealthy people didn't want the poor people, especially the poor children, trampling their gardens and picking their flowers and playing ball in their, on their lawns. And so this very visionary group of people on the city council proposed to develop a park on this island that was right off the shore of Geneva in Illinois. And and one of the reasons this drew my attention is I grew up about an hour, an hour and a half away from Geneva. So since that last episode, I did Google this and this park still exists. It's called Island Park and it's in Geneva, Illinois which I think is so cool. God bless people who had a vision or have a vision and create parks and open spaces and resources that a community can enjoy rather than having everything be private property. It's one of the things that I think is so amazing about Colonel Griffith in Los Angeles who donated the huge amount of land for Griffith Park Observatory and the Greek Theater and so much more. So where we left off is this group of people on the city council are endeavoring to build a park here and they host a picnic on the par- on the island and they have everybody who attends sign a petition for this park. So of course they get a lot of signatures and their budget is $15,000, which was not a lot of money for a park to be built. So they're starting to get it going. And we're going to pick up the story here. So hang on just a moment and we will continue. And And as I said, $15,000 wasn't a lot of money. They had hoped to hire somebody to help them with it, but You know, it was a laughable amount of money. So they decided that they would have to do this themselves. So I'm going to read a paragraph. I think I read this paragraph in the last episode, but I'm going to pick it up here and then we'll finish up the article. So deciding that they must depend upon themselves alone and lay out their park and playground without outside assistance, the commissioners ordered an engineering company to make a survey and topographic map of the island, and to furnish estimates for a bridge and stairway. The stairway was to be of concrete and match the large arch bridge, which is the main thoroughfare 
of the little town and connects the east and west sides. The stairway was to extend from the large arch bridge to the swampy land below, through which a road was to be built and a walk laid to the small bridge that was to span the river between the island and the swamp land. Estimates on several styles of bridges and stairways were received by the commission. But when winter took a hand, and they were compelled to restrict their operations to the cutting away and burning of underbrush. By spring, the island was pretty well cleared, and a path had been cut through and a road built across the tree-covered swampland. There were spots to be leveled and low places to be filled on the island also, and so another month passed before the commissioners were again able to turn their attention to the swampy arm of the mainland, which was to constitute the approach to their domain, and which had always been considered a malaria and mosquito breeder, a menace to the community. No one claimed this spot, in fact, no one would admit to being in any way interested in it. The commission was surely a representative of if such a thing ever existed. One of its members was a merchant, another postmaster, and the third a successful lawyer, business, politics, and law, certainly a formidable combination. What one could not think of, another invariably grasped. It was the lawyer who recognized the necessity for building stone retaining walls around the island, as it really is a silt deposit held together by the roots of the old trees, which were threatened by the constant washing of the river, and for extending a wall out into the river from the swamp land to protect the bridge from the ice. Then, as this arm was extended out into the river for the bridge's protection, the thought came to the lawyer, the new member of the commission, why can't we fill in this mosquito hole and turn it into a pleasing approach to our island? Nobody claims it. Why shouldn't we take it for the public? He could not answer that question, and neither could the commission, so they determined to reclaim the swamp. But they were doing a great many more things than had originally planned, and their funds were so low that they could not afford to spend the sum which a contractor would consider mighty slim for the reclaiming of that land. Yet they wanted the land. While these commissioners were busy men and able to give only their evenings and Sundays to the upbuilding of the island, they found time to solve the problems that confronted them, and this one met its solution in turn. Not far from the island, the electric road to Chicago had made a cut and left a large pile of dirt behind. It did not take the commission long to find someone who could get that dirt from the electric road free of charge, nor did it take them a great while to locate a contractor public-spirited enough to offer to haul the dirt for 25 cents a cubic yard, hardly enough to pay for the horses. For six weeks, a number of teams were constantly engaged in hauling this dirt, and then the commission had a good firm five acres to show for the swampy arm of the mainland. That was only one of the many plunges that the commission took into the realm of economy. It is, in fact, claimed that everyone who did work for them lost money on his contract. A capable young graduate from a horticultural school, a student of landscape gardening and tree dentistry, was hired to superintend the work under the direction of the commission, Two weeks of his time proved sufficient to put the trees on the island in excellent shape and to convert the dead timber into artistic benches and flower stands. But though the commission demanded the bottom prices on everything, they also demanded that whatever went into the island, whether workmanship or materials, should be the very best obtainable. The field house erected on the west shore of the island is an illustration of this fact. It is built to last, built of the best materials to be had. Its design is simple but artistic, its structure small but roomy and solid. This building 
complete with plumbing and extras, cost $5,320. It is 68 feet long and 44 feet wide, with a 15-foot terrace, and is built of rough, pressed brick in four colors to the window sills. Above that is a hollow tile coated with plaster. It has an open loggia, 36 by 44 feet, so arranged that it can be closed in the winter by hanging removable wooden doors. One wing of this building contains a locker room and toilet for men, this one with an eye to the future swimming pool to be provided on the island, and the other wing is given over for a restroom and toilet for the women. The open loggia and wide porches with their waist-high walls offer ample shelter in bad weather and an excellent place for dancing. The architect who designed the building was impressed with the necessity for economy and usefulness, but was at the same time given to understand that the building must contain neither cheap materials nor poor workmanship. In the summer, the removable doors of the loggia, I hope I'm saying that word right, L-O-G-G-I-A, is it loggia? Are stored in the attic of the field house, and in the winter the playground apparatus reposes there. It was the politician that scored heavily in the purchasing of the playground apparatus. He stumped the playgrounds of the neighboring cities for suggestions, and he got them. When he had determined just what was wanted, he went after the very bottom prices, and he got them too. The final result of this campaign was that the children's aisle now contained as full an equipment of apparatus as is to be found in almost any city playground, and the cost of this equipment was but $600. A double tennis court was built and equipped for $75. The present broad, shrub-covered approach to the island bears little resemblance to the old swamp that trailed from under the bridge, and the beautiful island itself holds promise of glorious days for the children, the young folks, and the old people. Isn't that amazing? And, and that this still exists. Again, it's called Island Park in Geneva, Illinois. And so here it is over a hundred years later and people are still using it. It's one of the things that I so appreciate about reading these old magazines and newspaper articles, especially when we come across someone or some people who had a vision and that vision is still paying dividends all these years later. Right, had they not claimed this island for a park, it could have gone into someone's private estate and no one would have ever had access to it. But generations of families, children, adults, have enjoyed this park space and this article tells us how it was created and the tenacity of the commissioners who had the vision to make this dream come true. So, way to go. Glad to glad to honor that history. Okay, well, we're still in this magazine. We may have skipped to a different time period. I don't know for sure. But there is a fascinating article about the avocado or alligator pear. So again, in 2024, we all know what an avocado is, whether you like them or not. We've had guacamole and avocado toast, and you can get avocados anywhere, and they are absolutely a part of our mainstream culture. But back in 1917, a lot of people didn't know what these were. So how about if we read this article about the avocado, or I guess as it was known, the alligator pear. So this is written by Arthur Hay. So as a boy, hunting the New York wharves along the East River, sometimes one would see swinging under the awning of a fruit steamer unloading bananas, a net filled with a strange fruit. 
If the mate were unusually good-natured and not too busy, he would give this delicacy the name of alligator pear. But as to allowing one a taste, no, indeed, they were worth too much. When these are gone, we won't be able to get any more until the next voyage. But why don't they import them? And the response is, they won't keep. Like I've got them here in a net is the only way to get them here, and hard enough at that they won't stand packing in the hold like bananas and they spoil every time. I can only imagine how hard that was. It was years later in Mexico that I finally got my first taste of this delicious fruit, but it now masqueraded under the name of Hahuacate. I'm probably mispronouncing it. A-H-U-A-C-A-T-E. At last I rejoiced. I should get a chance to see if it were really the food of the gods. Cut in half like a tiny musk melon, with the one big brown seed flipped out, there remained about half an inch of greenish-yellow pulp held in a firm green rind, the shape and wrinkled, leathery texture of which is responsible for the alligator part of the popular name. It was about the consistency of butter and tasted not unlike it, but with an aromatic tang. I must confess that I was not completely carried away, though even the first taste was good, but acquaintance increased its charm, and before I left Mexico I grew very fond of it. But taking up the question of supplying an increasing number of American enthusiasts, If we cannot import the fruit, why not import the seed and raise our own fruit? This happy thought struck a good many inhabitants of California nearly 30 years ago, from which time the yards of suburbs of Los Angeles and many a citrus town from Santa Barbara to San Diego began to be dotted with thrifty seedlings. Then the fruit commenced to appear in California markets and nurserymen began to dispute the merits of the various strains or varieties. For raised from seed, the avocado, to which we have corrupted the American hawakate, again, may not be saying that right, like the apple and other cultivated fruits, does not come true to variety. In other words, it may be as good as, but is more likely to be worse than its parents. So what the thrifty American uses the seedlings only for stock and grafts or buds upon its branch from a chosen improved variety. Avocado planting on a commercial scale had just about started when there came the disastrous freeze of January 1913, after which two facts became apparent to avocado growers. First, that avocados differ as widely as individuals in their resistance to frost. Second, that largely they may be divided into two groups, the thin-skinned, small-fruited Mexican highland varieties, fairly resistant to frost, and the hard-shell, large-fruited Guatemalan sorts, generally tender, though there were exceptions. A third type, the West Indian or South American, the prevailing commercial variety in Florida, is not grown in California. King among specimens of the first or hardy type was the ganter tree at Whittier, which stood absolutely unscathed when orange, lemon, and walnut, yes, even hardy pepper and eucalyptus, were frozen to the ground. So great was the rush for budwood from this wonderful tree that Mr. Ganter cleared thousands of dollars from that source alone, and finally was compelled to build a high fence around it. It is said that he also had it insured for $25,000, but the craze for granter trees is already slackening, and the hard-shelled, big-fruited avocado is coming into its own. It stands shipping so much better. For home use, the small, thin-skinned avocado should and probably will continue to be the first choice. As a class, It is better flavored, higher in fat content, and more prolific. Frequently, a tree of this group bears two or three thousand fruits in a season, weighing from a quarter to half a pound each, with a pulp containing 25 to 30 percent fat. 
Here is a fruit that ought to solve the high cost of living with a vengeance, but only as yet for the grower, hardly for the ultimate consumer. For avocados at present retail at from 35 to 75 cents each, and hence are luxuries. Isn't that interesting? I saw them at Walmart yesterday. I think they were 78 or 97 cents. So you can appreciate how expensive 35 or 75 cents would have been in 1917. The hope of the avocado grower, paradoxically as it may seem, as a great fall in the present price and a great increase in consumption, as soon as the common people, you and I for instance, find out how good a fruit it is. With avocados selling at 5 or 10 cents each, Thousands would buy where scores do now, with mutual benefit to consumer and grower. Isn't that interesting? I don't know that I had my first avocado until I moved to California. I mean, maybe I did, but it certainly was not a food that I grew up with. And I think I probably first had it in guacamole. You know, I I would have never just thought of eating an avocado I'm sure it was it was guacamole for me. And then I think it, it really has only been in the last 10 years that this thing called avocado toast <laughs> became a wondrous, wondrous, delightful food. So I do buy avocados every once in a while. I'm the only one who eats them. Wes does not like them. So I don't buy a lot of them because I don't eat a lot of them, but every once in a while I love good avocado toast or I'll put avocado on my sandwich. Um, Certainly if I'm getting tacos or something, I love some guacamole. So interesting. I, I mean, certainly where I grew up in Skokie, avocados were definitely not a mainstream food. Okay, let's see what else I can find for us in this periodical. (laughs) I couldn't find that word. I was going to say magazine and periodical, and they both reached my brain at the same time. Does that ever happen to you? Which word shall I pick? Both. This magazine periodical. Let us continue looking. Well, there's an ad here for Franco-American soups. Now, I think the only thing I know about Franco-American is I think they are or were the parent company for SpaghettiOs, which my sister loved, by the way. (laughs) She loved her SpaghettiOs. There was some sort of ditty that went Franco-American, but I don't, and that might not be it. I'm just, listen, it's been at least 50 years since I heard that. I don't recall them being a soup company, though, but let's read this ad. The soup of the Epicure. Cooks and the weather will always vary. So said a disappointed hostess who had trusted, not wisely, but too well in her own kitchen. No home cook can be a specialist in soups. She has to divide her time among too many things for that. So in many homes, where the cuisine is otherwise above reproach, the soup course is more than apt to be an embarrassing question mark. Who knew that in 1916 soup could be such a source of anxiety for the hostess. But we have an answer for you. But, and that was my editorial about the anxious hostess. They just were talking about her being embarrassed by her soup. I would just not serve soup. Come on, let's just go right to the salad. But but this is an ad for soup, so let's keep going on our soup story. But the splendid quality of Franco-American soups can never vary it reveals the specialist. It never deviates into inferiority. Fully worth the money is really an understatement of the value, the comfort, and the convenience of these soups to women who demand that their food shall always be good. A visitor watched us making chicken soup. She saw poultry pampered to a proud plumpness. (laughs) Okay, can I just read that to you again? She saw poultry pampered to a proud plumpness. Have I mentioned before how I love the copywriters of this time? 
She saw the dark meat yield its rich and appetizing juices, I'm sorry to my vegan friends, clarified to sparkling purity. She saw us adding the tenderest squares. Okay, I'm not going to talk about the meat anymore, but there's rice involved. And she noted the delicate seasoning and then she tasted. Such soup simply cannot be made at home, she said. Okay, do you want to bet a quarter? She did not say that and she does not even exist. And you will agree. It's 20 cents the can, double the size, 35 cents. And they have tomato. Okay, there's a lot of, there's a lot of vet, um, animal soups here, so I'm not going to talk about them. Mulligatawny, which is just, I don't even know what that is, but it's a fun word. They have mulligatawny. <laughs> Wonderful. And clear vegetable. Okay. And then at the bottom, it says Franco-American broths for invalids and children. 15 cents a can. Good news. All right, I'm scrolling through a bunch of ads, and there's a bunch of ads for cars. It must have been a really remarkable thing to live through the era when cars were becoming mainstream. I think like a telephone, right? And we certainly have lived through it in our own time with the internet. I mean, talk about a wondrous invention that changed the world, right? So let's read about some of these cars. The Franklin car. I've never heard of that. What is there about the Franklin car that gives an entirely new sense of efficiency to the man who has owned 10 other motor cars and now owns four of different makes? Well, someone is really hoarding a lot of cars, um, whoever their customer is, whatever this thing may be, whatever the factors responsible for it, it can be covered by one general term, road ability. It is, in fact, that any man who owns other cars and a Franklin will find himself always using the Franklin for his own driving, for sure. No, I added the for sure. It's not really in there. I'm just getting punchy. So just be forewarned. <laughs> I've kind of reached my um, my punchy time. Roadability, as you will find in the Franklin cars, is the all-around ability to show speed, safety, comfort, and economy in service month after month, and taking road conditions as they come. Even the enclosed Franklin cars are showing a higher roadability than most motorists will dream of getting out of their open cars of whatever the make. With the Franklin car, you have a quick getaway. You have speed on the hills. You have maximum speed from place to place. Not merely that short burst between nearby points, but the hour in, hour out, maximum average that makes long distance touring a success. The ability of the Franklin car is an ability you can use without working yourself. They go on. This is a big, long ad. So let's just see how much they cost. The limousine. Let's just, let's just go for it, right? The limousine is $3,000. The cabriolet, I guess that was a term that was being used back then, was $2,650. And again, Franklin Automobile Company, which is followed by an ad for Packard. Now, Packard, I've heard of. I couldn't tell you much about them, but I'm just saying I, I, I know that company in my consciousness. So this is range extenders. It is the plus power of twin six motors that makes Packard limousines all-purpose cars, freed from the confines of city pavements, liberated for service on the rough country roads. The open road holds no more difficulties for the Packard limousine than for any touring car. Wherever the urge may lead, go now in comfort, sheltered from wind and storm and dust. Getting a little creative with my reading here. Um, it, it is a great motor, this twin six of ours, that makes this luxurious far range travel possible for all the family in all weathers on all highways. So that's the Packard limousine. There's an ad for a Victrola. It says, brings the opera right into your home. All the magnificent numbers of opera, superbly sung by artists famous for their master interpretations of each particular role. 
Caruso, Alda, Calve, Farrar, Martinelli, Rufo are among the mighty group the Victrola brings to you to sing the captivating music of Carmen. So it is throughout the entire range of opera and all music and entertainment. With the Victrola, you hear the greatest artists of all the world in your own home. Again, that must have been a remarkable development that all of a sudden you could hear recorded music in your home. All right, and then I found my way into the next month's issue, which is December of 2016. It's their Christmas issue, which we'll probably look through another time. But let me read to you some real estate. I don't think I've read these ones already because this is an article about places in Ormond Beach, Florida. I don't know where Ormond Beach is. But if you're interested in Ormond Beach in 1916, perhaps one of these homes will will resonate for you. So this house fronts on the Halifax River, being the first cottage south of the Hotel Ormond of the Florida East Coast. So now we know East Coast. So um, it was built in 1914, so it's just a few years old. It has nine master's bedrooms, eight master's bathrooms, one bedroom with bath on the first floor, octagonal living room with a large fireplace, a breakfast room and sunroom, Weber Grand Piano, dining room, butler's pantry, kitchen, large cellar, furnace with thermostat, hot water heater, sleeping porch on second story, private dock, in a separate building also new as the garage with a pit, five servants' rooms, bathroom complete, laundry with set of tubs, the bedroom furniture is painted to harmonize with the color of the walls of each room and is included in the selling price. The grounds contain many fruit and ornamental trees and flowering plants. House is ready for immediate occupancy and the owner is willing to take large mortgage and they might rent. Okay, and here's another one. This is an Indian River Orange Grove. The 1,001-acre plantation is located at Lyrata on the Indian River, L-Y-R-A-T-A, about 12 miles north of Titusville, with the East Coast Automobile Highway running through the grove and the East Coast Railway Station immediately in front with post office and freight facilities, and a dock running out into the Indian River, about 35 acres of orange and grapefruit trees in grove form, and an enormous nursery of small orange trees. The place has been steadily improved for over 25 years by the late owners, and can be bought reasonably with a large mortgage on easy terms. Every acre of bearing fruit trees is worth $1,000, and there's probably 500 acres of this track suitable for fruit. Here's another one. Answer the call of the Southland, subtropical Edgewood for sale. The most ideal small country estate and fruit grove in Florida. Two and a half miles over important thoroughfare to the city limits of Miami. Contains 10 acres, over 900 bearing fruit trees, four farm buildings, and tropical nine-room house with water and gas, surrounded by large mango and avocado trees. We were just learning about avocado trees. Grounds are artistically planted with palms and other tropical shrubbery, admitted to be one of the finest show places below the frost line. Fresh fruit, flowers, and sunshine the year round. Three years spent studying entire state before selecting this particular spot as the most healthful and best adapted for fruit culture. Scientific preparation, selection, and care assure permanent paying investment with minimum expenses. Nearly 800 citrus and 200 other choice tropical trees on paying basis. Finest climate in America, valued at $25,000, a state must be settled promptly and will be sold at a bargain. 
interesting. I wonder how long it stayed as one lot before it got subdivided. If it's that close to Miami, that was gold for a family. Okay, and then our last one is going to be in California. It is a beautiful new residence in Riverside, California, a country home in the city. The house, a large, modern, mission-type bungalow built three years ago with walls of hollow tile and concrete, making the house cool in summer and warm in winter. It has a large living room, which is 18 by 36, with built-in bookcases and beam ceilings, 10 feet high, and a large cobblestone fireplace. The dining room is 16 by 24 and has built-in china cabinets and buffets. Just so you know, built-ins are the best in these houses. High wainscoting and beam ceiling. There are three bedrooms. One is 18 by 20 and the others of good size. The kitchen has all the modern improvements. The den is 12 by 14, complete laundry, concrete porch, tiled fireplaces and mantles in all the rooms. Good size court filled with choice flowers surrounded on three sides by the house and with a high wall at the rear affords light and air to the entire house. The two bathrooms and four toilets in the house have the best standard plumbing and fixtures. The bronze hardware is made by Yale and Town Company. The electric fixtures are extra fine throughout the house, and there is a new Rector gas radiator system for heating each room. The house stands 500 feet from the avenue, thereby avoiding all noise and dust. There also is a gardener's cottage with four rooms and a bath, also a garage with a concrete floor and pit, a cow barn with concrete floor, and a large up-to-date chicken house. As for the grounds, it includes 10 acres. Amazing, right? 10 acres, beautifully situated on La, Can- La Candina, let's see, La Candina, L-A-C-A-D-E-N-A. We'll go with La Cadena, Dania, La Cadena Drive. Okay, little aside here. When I first moved to Los Angeles, me, Skokie Girl, had so much trouble pronouncing the street names that were pronounced in Spanish. So La Jolla, I thought was La Jala. <laughs> I thought La Cienega was La Cienega. I crucified these names, so I'm sure I'm doing the same to, I bet it's La Cadena, right? If it's D-E-N-A, it's not a na, it's nya, right? La Cadena Drive. I don't know. Make fun of me if I'm wrong. It's okay. I don't mind. Um, it's a, But what's more important is that it is a mile and a quarter from the Glenwood Mission Hotel. The property has a frontage of nearly 700 feet on this avenue, which is the most traveled of all gateways in the city. Four and a half acres are parked with choice trees and shrubs, and there's a beautiful sunken garden. I I don't know what that is, but that sounds cool, which among other flowers has hundreds of choice roses, including 30 varieties. The grounds were laid out by Landscape Gardener. There are handsome lawns, vegetable garden of the richest soil, a palm garden, a lily and goldfish pond with a bird fountain, a small rockery, and a cascade. I'm assuming that's a waterfall feature or pond feature. There are two other building sites on this property, all facing to the avenue. And, and in case you were not already sold on this, there is an orchard of young trees just beginning to bear fruit, including oranges, apples, peaches, pears, plums, cherries, walnuts, figs, avocados, there's our avocados again, tangerines, grapes, blackberries, loganberries, raspberries, and strawberries. Okay, deep breath in. Is that not a dream come true to have all of that on your grounds? So all city conveniences, there is gas, pure water, under high pressure, electricity for lighting power, telephone, streetcars, 
private sewage system, and hydrant fire protection. The building and other improvements cost over $18,000 and land values $15,000. This fine estate is located on a broad ridge that has a commanding view of mountain and valley that is unequaled in Riverside. The rapidly advancing value of adjacent real estate excludes any but fine new homes in this section of the city. For further information and terms, address C.W. Hickok, the builder and owner. Well, okay, there you go. We'll take our 2024 money, go back in time to buy this lovely bungalow with many acres and a fruit salad living out in your backyard in Riverside, California. Sounds good. So, okay, my sweet ones, I hope that you have enjoyed our time together. And I wish you the sweetest of dreams. I wish you love and blessings and goodness. And I look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you so much. And I love you.